Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. Hey, Thriving Farmers, Michael Kilpatrick here. So today I got to interview Robin Calvi from Park Ridge Organics in Wisconsin. We had a fabulous conversation and it was so fun interviewing her because they've been farming for about 10 years now, have definitely done the work, been there, worked through a lot of things on the farm to make it a profitable, sustainable farm. And the farm does support them fully. And uh, she was talking to me before we got on the episode that this is the first year they're actually taking a vacation to. Arizona for a week because the farm's profitable and it pays them. And one of the things actually that has been a key aspect of it, and we mentioned a few times in the episode, is the Harvey CSA platform. So I definitely like recommend you listen to the episode for her talking about managing her team. So she has really worked hard about building out key players on her team, which has allowed her to be a true business owner and not someone working in the business. So we talk about how she set that up, how she keeps people, how she sometimes gets a little OCD about the farm business, but because her employees understand why she's running it the way she is and why she's tweaking things, that they're okay with her getting in there and making changes. Um, We also talked about her sales outlets, why she loves CSA as the major part of that, why she still keeps some wholesale and some farm store and, and farmer's markets. We talked about soil and the cropping she's growing as well. So she does not grow all the crops she gives to her CSA and actually does not grow four crops. And so we talk about why that is, the different crops she doesn't grow. And yeah, it was just a fun episode. They do about 350 to 370 shares. And uh, she talks about how Harvey has made that them a more profitable farm. It's made them have less stress. And it's allowed them to be more efficient with the produce they are growing. So Simon over at Harvey is still offering anyone who uses growing farmers as a a coupon code, $200 off their initial sign up. So again, if you're interested in Harvey, give them guys, them a call over there. They will walk you through it if it's a good fit for you. Um, if it's not, they're not going to recommend it to you. So go mention growing farmers or the Thriving Farmer podcast to the folks over at Harvey, and you'll get $200 off your setup fee for the program. And it's, uh, as Robin said, lots of different features that can help your farm grow. And join me in welcoming Robin to the podcast. Welcome to the podcast, Robin. Hi, thanks for having me. Can you give us a little bit of an overview of your farming operation? Uh, Yes, Park Ridge Organics. We're located in eastern Wisconsin, and the farm itself is about... 15 acres. And we started back in 2003. My parents started the farm. Now we're currently, we have about seven acres in production and uh, we're maxed out. So 15 acres of land, but a bunch of that is buildings, houses, on tillable land. So seven in production is the most we can ever have. And uh, we make good, good use of it. We're constantly um, using it all. So yeah, the farm itself is primarily CSA is our main gig, about 80% of our sales and go through our CSA program. And then uh, we do have a standing spot at our uh, local farmer's market. Uh, We've been there for, I don't know, eight, 10 years, something like that. We were the first organic farm there. That's about 15% of our sales. We have another small chunk that comes from our wholesale accounts. I shouldn't say small, but it's, uh, you know, part of our sales does come from wholesale. We have restaurants and local grocers Uh that purchase from us. And then our very smallest chunk of sales channel is our farm store. So we do have an on-farm store, and that's actually where the whole story of the farm began. My parents wanted to just have a little roadside stand. Okay. Um, and that's kind of how it began. So. Gotcha. What was your background before you came to the farm? I was a very environmental-focused person, so I went off to college near my hometown, about an hour and a half from my hometown, uh, University of Wisconsin-Stevens Point and pursued a degree in forestry. Okay. I guess I wasn't totally sure what I, I just knew I loved trees. That sounds so fluffy and so um, <laughs> tree hugger. Like it is exactly what it was. I liked trees. Uh-huh. I didn't, I really didn't see myself being a commercial logger or any of the types of jobs that a lot of the people I was going to school with were pursuing. Uh-huh. You know, they were going to work for the DNR. They were going to 
worked at the Forest Service. I was like, mm, I just like trees. So I think I was a little bit lost, but I did find direction, you know, just in the plant-based sciences. And uh-huh. I learned a lot of entomology and soils and all these just great foundations for what I later am now using in farming. So um, after my forestry degree was completed, I moved off to California. I thought that was a good idea at the time. San Diego, where there are no trees. So yes. that was interesting. But I landed a job with a nonprofit organization called People for Trees, and we planted street side trees. So we went into neighborhoods, planted shade trees along their boulevard. Oh, very and cool. And this concept to them was crazy, right? They all had palm trees. Here you are in this heat sink of the nation where everyone's struggling with energy costs, uh, yet they don't use shade trees mm. um, nearly like we do. It was really interesting. It was a great job. It introduced me. When I went to the interview, I'll never forget it because I was like fresh out of college, so nervous for my first real job interview. And they basically were like, what? You have a degree in from a place in Wisconsin where a lot of people had degrees in forestry. And so they just thought I was the best thing ever. Uh-huh. And um, it was hilarious. It was great to me. So they were really excited to have me on board. And But what I learned, I mean, it wasn't so much a forestry job, right? It was more of a people skills job and understanding what how nonprofits worked. I had no idea what a nonprofit was or what that meant. So learning mm. the structure of a nonprofit, working with a board of directors, having a mission that was not necessarily a tangible item, right? It wasn't, mm-hmm. we were doing something that was bigger than us. So it was, um, it was, it was really a great job that since kind of fizzled out for me, I needed to come back to the Midwest. So I did come back and work in Milwaukee, but kept on the nonprofit train by uh, working for some other nonprofits in Milwaukee doing river advocacy work. So I moved Mm. away from trees, but still was in the environmental world. And um, there I had a job as a membership coordinator for the Milwaukee Riverkeeper group. And I learned financials and I learned how to use QuickBooks. And Mm. I learned, I was sent to like um, employee management you know, workshop kind of stuff. I had a great boss at the time. And so she was really helpful with kind of getting me my bearings. What, what she really was building was for me to be a business owner. Like she didn't know it and I didn't know it, but I was mm. learning all these really important tools that I would later use to help run a successful business. Very cool. So it was kind of setting you up for success when you came back to the farm. Mm-hmm. Very much so. I didn't realize that at the time, but it definitely taught me some really great foundational things that you need to know when you're running a business. I think the financial part alone, just understanding finances, being able to look at budgets, understand budgets, and how to ask for money. My job in Milwaukee was to ask people to give us money, right? Mm -hmm. And (laughs) I hate to say it, that's what you kind of are when you're a business owner, you're asking people to give you money. And if you can do it and create your message in a really good, positive way, it helps you be more successful. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So what year did you end up coming back to the farm? It was like 2006 when I came back to the farm. So my parents had started the farm in 2003. So there were Uh a few years that had gone by um, where my parents were dabbling in it. And I moved back home in 2006. Very cool. And then at that point, was it the same size or did you start scaling it up? Uh, it was super small, and they were just going to, again, have this little roadside stand. They had converted the garage. Basically, they cleaned up the garage and put a little two-door cooler in there, and they were just going to have this roadside stand. And when I worked in Milwaukee, um, my boss there did belong to a CSA. So one time I had house sat for her. I was helping her out. They were out of town. So I was at her house, and she said, help yourself to any of the vegetables in the fridge. They're all from our CSA farm that we get our veggies from. And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I had no idea yeah. what that concept was. So she introduced me to that. And I thought, well, this is pretty cool. So when I moved home in 2006, um, and by the way, I did move home because my, my parents were doing this farming thing. And my dad was like loving it and telling mm. me how great it was. And I was like, you know, maybe I want to be with my parents and, and be a little bit closer to family and, um, you know, see what this is all about. So when I moved home, I said, dad, we should, you should check out this CSA model, you know, this model of agriculture where people um, get paid up front for their product and they know exactly how much to grow and they have these members and it's very collaborative and um, an exciting way to grow food. And he said, oh, I just visited a farm 
over in Plymouth, which is about 30 minutes from our farm. I just visited a farm over there, Springdale Farm. Mm. Um, well, Springdale is Peter and Bernadette Seeley. They've been the longest running CSA pretty much in the state of Wisconsin. So uh-huh. my dad just stumbled across their farm by driving by <laughs> and not, and being the, my parents were the kind of people that if they drove by something, they would just like pull in the driveway and knock on the door. So <laughs> okay. they did that. And they, they formed a relationship with what would become one of our biggest mentors over the farming years, right? A successful farm, lots of knowledge. And Peter was so willing to share that knowledge with my dad. So we did start our CSA actually didn't, I think the first year we took true members was probably like 2007. I have no record of it. Mm. I'm pretty sure there were about 10 or 15 members. We were awful at it. I mean, I, we started small, which is, sounds like a good idea, but I remember the first week picking all the broccoli and then going, well, what are we going to give next week? Like, I just had no idea what I was doing. Mm. Um, had no, <laughs> I just, I hadn't really, um, exposed myself to enough CSA knowledge yet. So we, we, sk- we didn't do it. We didn't do it for a couple of years. I think a couple more years went by where we thought we're not going to do these shares. I mean, this is a huge obligation. You're taking yeah. this money and you better know what you're doing. So um, it took a couple of years, a season or two to do as much education as I could and um, came back at it in 2009. That's my, now I do have a record of who the members were because some of them still are members. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, we got way better at it. Started with like 30 members that first year and um, we're just wrapped up our 2019 season with packing out about 370 shares a week. So okay. definitely have grown over those 10 years in um, share numbers. And it's, um, it's interesting though. You, I have the same, that same feeling inside that you have a huge obligation to do the best that you can do. So whether you have 15 members or you have 415 members, it's, um, it, to me, it's the same, that same feeling, that same obligation and commitment that you have to people who are committing to your business. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So let's talk a little bit about the, the farm systems. You've got, um, from looking at your pictures, it feels like you've got a really good soil profile there. We do. So my dad, way back when, even though I didn't know what he was doing, he really did, um, learned from Peter that, you know, what compost was. So my uh-huh. dad started making compost back at the very beginning and applying um, compost every year. So um, we now have somewhere in the six to 8% organic matter um, wow. in our soil profile. Yeah, it's pretty great. We have parts of the farm that aren't so pretty. Um, uh-huh. we're, we're, Lake Winnebago is the lake that's near us and it's a pretty large body of water. And we're close enough to it that some of our soil profile reflects that we probably at one time were lake bottom. So okay. we have some really, really rocky parts. And I don't mean big rocks that you can go pick up. I mean, like, you know, two inch <laughs> diameter rocks that if you pick them all up, there would be nothing left. Yes. Um, yeah. But yeah. it's pretty cool. We've just learned what grows well on them. We work. I always say the soil between the rocks is really yes. nice. <laughs> and it yeah. works out fine. It just depends on uh, we've adapted. So yeah. um, now we have great drainage. Uh, really proud of our soil. It's something that my dad, um, you know, worked at for many, many years. And now um, one of my longest running employees, Jeff, he's our field production manager. He continues to make sure that our soil is top priority. Mm-hmm. Okay. So on that soil, that's the really rocky stuff. What are you, what grows well there? I mean, I have an idea, but. Um, yeah. So you, you know, lettuce, we do mm-hmm. pretty well with lettuce. Um, none of the heavy feeding crops. So I can tell you what we would never put on it. And that would be like, we wouldn't put a brassica yep. on the rocks and we wouldn't put a sol- solanaceae crop on the rocks. but um, things like, yeah, lettuces, we actually do root on the rocks. So, okay. Uh, Believe it or not, somehow a carrot can, the hardest part with like a carrot is that they grow okay in the rocks because they find their way, right? Yeah. Um, but it's cultivating them that's mm-hmm. trickier. So mm-hmm. we like to use a basket weeder mm-hmm. for our um, three row cultivation or anything direct seeded and the, the rocks pose a problem, right? Uh, basket yeah. weeders don't really work. Yeah. Um, yeah. So sometimes it's more, we're limited by that. It wouldn't be that the the rocks would prohibit the carrots from actually, they grow pretty well. Beets do pretty well. Those are yeah. a little bit easier because cultivation can be easier than the uh, long germinating carrots. Yeah. Uh, what yeah, about cucurbits? Like cucurbits, we don't, we do on plastic. 
Yeah. So, um, and we only grow uh, cucumber zucchini. We don't do any squash at our farm. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, there's actually about four large crops that we do not grow, and we've bought, we've chosen uh, to buy them in. So, but back to the rock question: if it's on plastic, we don't put it on the rocks because we don't do much plastic culture. But mm-hmm. it, it's tricky to get plastic to lay right and uh, yeah. just being loose and blowing away. So Okay, so the um, rocks are that bad that you don't want to lay plastic there. That's Oh, like you couldn't. You yeah, couldn't that's a lot plastic. of rocks. <laughs> oh, it's yeah. a crazy amount of rocks. And it's only a, you know, it's a strip that runs through the farm. So Yeah. I would say overall um the surface area of our farm that's made up of that rocky ridge only makes up like 15% of gotcha. our land. Very cool. All right. So then the four crops you don't grow, what are those? Uh, we do not grow potatoes. Yep. Uh, we do not grow corn. Okay. We don't grow winter squash and we don't grow any fruit. Okay. So no melons, no strawberries, none, no fruit. <laughs> no fruit in the sense of what people yeah. think of as fruit, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Well, those are the lowest yielding per acre crops. And because you're so yeah. land trapped you just don't have more space to grow those right and we've tried them all i mean we've had our we've dabbled in it before we had is those are decisions we made to you know take on more shares Mm -hmm. but eliminate some crops and i've heard you know both sides of that some farms truly believe that you should try to grow it all you know i've I've sat with farmers that have said well i just think you need to if your soil can can grow it i think farms should try to grow it all and i definitely disagree we just weren't good at it. We'd always have scab on our potatoes and um, so labor intensive. I mean, I haven't done a ton of crop analysis, but I do know certain crops that just were obviously not making sense. Potatoes were one of them. Corn was one of them. We weren't very good at it. That was very clear when we would be harvesting or we'd get the corn smuts all over, which you can only find, you know, fancy Mexican, so many fancy Mexican restaurants that will buy the corn smut corn, Yeah, (laughs) which we did find in the year. (laughs) We were trying to be resourceful, but uh, yeah, corn is another one. And, and melons, Uh, Mm -hmm. melon, actually we've stopped. We don't even buy them in because um, the space of them is not, we do a value driven share now. So it has to, if if it's going to have that much space in our share box, it uh-huh. would have to have like an eight dollar value, which is you no, know, you can't. No one's going to want to pay eight dollars for for a melon. So, some of these decisions are actually just on a on a financial basis. Interesting, us. interesting. All right, so break that down for me a little bit. So, when you're doing your value based share, um, are you doing like a month, a weekly value that you like to see in that share, and how are you assigning those values? All right, so um, we use Harvey. Yep. And Harvey is the um, software platform that has been out and being used now for, I think it just wrapped up three seasons in use. We just finished our second season using it. Um, and the software platform allows the farmer to set a target value for the member's box. So okay. if, our, if our member pays $20 per week for a 20-week delivery, their share is $400. Yeah. Um, but we really look at it on the per week basis. So they are going to get $20 worth of value or um, you have the, the flexibility to set that value um, however you want it to be. So in our case, we actually set our target value a hair underneath $20. So on the $20 uh, box example, um, we will set our target value at $19. Okay. And the reason for that is um, the Harvey system is, really a magical tool for the member okay so we have decided that it's actually okay and totally justifiable to make sure that some of the costs that we're paying to harvey is being paid for by the member Mm. um and this is so different from the way that csa has been um you know the model itself is typical of giving more produce than people paid for and unfortunately that was just not a system that we could continue um, functioning in financially. Yeah. The farm was giving away 30% more, 30 to 40% more produce than what people were paying for. Wow. And to me, that just didn't make sense. And we don't yeah. go to the grocery store and buy a dozen eggs and get 15, right? You get yeah. 12. Like yeah. people actually want what they're paying for and they're okay with getting what they're paying for. Yeah. Um, so in the Harvey system, you know, it's going to give them $19 plus or minus 5% of uh, 
value in their share. And those values are based on what we determine each individual item for that particular week to be. So, you know, on a, on the, I don't know, on the first week of the season, we might have eight different items. Um, they might average around $3. So the member is going to get roughly seven of those items. Gotcha. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, you know, I don't want, I don't need to like totally explain the Harvey system, but the, the platform operates where your members set preferences and um, are able to uh, only get items in their share that they actually want. Yeah. So it kind of auto big, builds the box for them. Right. It's another big stray from the traditional CSA model yeah. where we kind of, you're, you know, the kale is good and you're going to get it kind of thing. That's yeah. How we used to be. And like, we're just going to shove as much kale as we can in that box and, you know, I view that as it was, it's fine. And some people loved eating that way and still probably do. But I sort of see that as there was a food guilt, right? So us mm. as the farm, we were just taking all these crops that we put so much work into growing and they're beautiful and they're in the field. And I'm looking at all the sage and I'm like, but we have to pick it all. We have to yeah. give it to the members. And then we felt good about it, right? So we're putting it in their shares. But truly what was happening is the members were going home and looking at this stuff and going, why did they give us so much sage? Yeah. What am I going to do with it? And then there, we just passed the guilt on to the member. So now they're mm. at home trying to figure out what to do with all of it. And I think what's happening with customized shares is that farmers are kind of owning up to some of the <laughs> responsibility we have. And mm. so and what it's doing for us is over now two seasons of using it, of using the software, we're able to see what we don't need to grow as much of. Mm. We're totally changing the way that we do our farm and crop planning because um, we're more efficient. So there's a backside to using a customized share system that I think is not as obvious to farms yeah. when they're exploring that option that we are able to be more efficient. We can only grow on seven acres. So if I know now that I don't need to grow nearly as much, you know, celeriac, yeah. And instead, people want more broccoli. Well, then we've made those adjustments and it's really a beautiful system. So we're seeing that it's just more efficient um, over time if we're able to make those changes that matter. Mm -hmm. That is so cool. So you would say then that implementing that Harvey system has been a huge game changer for your farm? Huge game changer. Probably one of the best decisions that we've made. It was also a very scary decision to make because you change oh, yeah. all your systems. You're changing your this, you know, very important membership base that you've developed, and now you're throwing at them something different. So um, it, it definitely has been one of the best decisions we've made. I wish I would have made it sooner. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't. A, it wasn't really around. Uh, the difference with Harvey's and other customized share systems is that. Um, the default box that a member receives is already is based on their preferences. So mm. the default is already customized. Yeah. Um, that was what the, that was the main reason that I decided to take that big change and sign on with it was because the default box is already customized versus a member having to go in and make changes every week. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's really cool. So as a farmer, there are endless tasks to be done on the farm. What systems have you set up to ensure you focus and tackle your most vital priorities? Actually, all these years of doing it, it wasn't until like last year that I feel like we implemented the best system, um, which is that we started kind of making a transparent task board. Okay. So, and I'm not, I think I, I think I sort of learned it from seeing some other farming systems that were using it, but basically we have a, uh, Instead of having like to-do lists for each, uh, we don't have many employees, but the few that we do have, it's really important, you know, and everyone plays a very vital role. Everyone has their own task list, but also so much of it overlaps when you're in a yeah. small farm that in, that we've just, we kind of use this open board. So it's, it's organized by a two week, you know, two weeks at a time. We made these little, it's a whiteboard magnetic, yep. made these little pieces of paper that have the tasks. So we kind of categorize tasks, whether it's a greenhouse job or a field work or irrigation, something in the pack shed, whatever it might be, like just took those general categories and then we list out, list out the tasks. And so they're all hanging up on this whiteboard. So whether or not you're the pack shed manager or you're the field production manager, you know what, what's kind of on the docket for what needs to be done in mm -hmm. everyone's categories. 
And that really was a fantastic system. I'm really happy with it because I think it just made it feel more collaborative. Mm. Um, I, you know, I have great employees that keep coming back every year and um, the field manager always would have his little notebook, which he still does. I know Jeff still has his little notebook in his pocket, but that's a lot to carry around. If someone just has this really daunting to-do list Uh um, and nobody else knows about it, I feel like it can be more mentally exhausting for someone. So I think I really liked having stuff written out so that we all knew what was on Jeff's mind. Um, Mm. You know, and then if somebody else had time or, hey, we're going to be out in that field, do you want us to pick up that row cover or whatever it might be, um, people were able to see all that. Oh, that is such a cool idea. It was a really great system. And we kept all those little tickets and we tracked time. So if it was, you know, pounding in post for tomato trellis, we wrote that down, like how many people hours that it took for that job to get done. You know, I, I guess someday I'll maybe, it, it does help because I think there's things you think are going to take an hour and then you're like, wow, that took 15 minutes or the yeah. opposite is usually the case where you think it's going to yeah. take an hour and it took you 10. So now we kind of can have that information. I don't, we're a pen and paper kind of farm. So yeah. a lot of stuff gets written down. It doesn't necessarily mean that I'm spending my winter tabulating it, but yeah. even just writing it down makes you so much more aware you know, just makes you more aware of stuff, like acknowledging it. Or even I might have known in my head that that took so much time, but to have an employee write down how much time it takes makes them a little Mm. bit more aware of it. Yeah. And that actually might be a great job for one of the team if they can come back a little bit early in the season to kind of sort through some of that and try to see the trends. Yep, it is. It's an interesting, or I feel like we'll be able to look back if we're like, oh, should we plan that for that day? Do you think we can get that done? And do you remember how long that took? Okay, well, we probably should plan that for a day and a half or whatever it might be. Yeah, exactly. So every day, how do you organize your day on the farm? Um, so, you know, full disclosure, I'd mentioned to you that I have a two and a half year old daughter. So yes, that, yes. Um, that, and that before her, I will admit the farm was my everything. Uh-huh. Um, my partner, Brad, and I live at the farm. I bought the farm from my parents. We live happily in the agrihood. My parents live next door. You know, we're this great second generation system. It's really a great place to be, but it also was my everything. I poured all of my time and every energy into the farm. Um, choosing to have a child was the best thing ever for me uh-huh. to redirect my priorities um, I think having a child was probably the only thing that was going to change that <laughs> Yeah. Um, because it just puts things in a different perspective. And so um, since she's been here, I did take a year, a season or two off, which is crazy. I mean, I wasn't off. I was still yeah. very present, but I wasn't, she wasn't going her first year. She didn't go to a daycare or anything. So yeah. I was kind of managing from the house sort of thing. My payroll was super high, mm-hmm. which I was okay with. Um, but now she does go to daycare. She goes, uh, three or four days a week. And, um, so, but what it did from a daily operation is that it pulled me out of that part of the system. Mm -hmm. So I have a great manager, Becky, who's our pack shed and wholesale manager. And she's also just the day to day, uh, person. So she, um, is who everybody reports to at 7am. She tasks out people on their jobs, um, does a fantastic job of it. And then I actually like show up for work at eight o'clock and report to her and say, Becky, what do you need me to do on a lot of days? There's some days where I'm like, I'm not asking you what you need me to do because I have something else I have to do. But she's, um, she does a phenomenal job of it. And so we do a lot of our talking at the end of the day Mm -hmm. um, because that's when I'm able to be more present. So at the end of the day, we'll kind of talk about what's to come. Uh Um, We do also part of that task system that I was telling you about. We start, we have our harvest Uh plan all laid out for the whole week as well. So we determine that the week before. So on Friday afternoon, we actually decide what days of the week following the the week to come, what's going to be done on what days. So Uh that really helps me to be able to not be involved in the day to day because it's sort of planned out already. Yeah. Um, Yeah, absolutely. A lot of pre-planning helps. Yeah. So she's almost taking the role of like an integrator in your business. And if people aren't familiar with that, they should check out the book Traction by Gino Wickham. And uh, that was kind of a huge, in our business, that was a huge thing for us to do is to build out that person who kind of manages the business and then frees me up to actually do like a lot of the creative work. So like the podcasting and, and actually creating content and all that kind of stuff. So that's amazing that you've got that person in the place and that they're working out so well for you. 
It's so key. Yeah. And I think both of my managers, Jeff and Becky, kind of play that role because mm. Jeff has the, he's the field guy, Becky's the person, yeah. the people person, and you sort of need both and they work well together doing that. So, you know, I've never heard that term. That's great yeah. that, <laughs> that I have that and I don't even know it. I think it comes from, I don't know, I get, hiring the right person mattered and then also having the ability to let some of my control go. Mm-hmm. Is what was the hardest part for me. And again, having a child to me, it was a no brainer, right? Yeah. Cause I, knew, I had a different priority, but I think that's something farmer, a good farmer and most farmers have a hard time letting go of control. Totally mm-hmm. understandable. I think if you, if you aren't trying to control this, your business, then you probably aren't that great at it. That sounds a little bit bold to say, but I do think good business owners, um, have a really good handle on what's happening with their mm. business, right? So yes. um, it's nothing to be, I don't feel like it's anything to be ashamed of or not proud of. I'm proud that I'm kind of a control freak. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because yeah. it can be used in ways, it's always seen as this negative um, personality trait, but it really can be a strong personality trait. And um, But the ability to pass some of that on and give responsibilities to other people on your farm is so valuable and having them trust you and um, and I continue to work every single season on making sure that I'm being uh, appreciative enough for those people that are, are helping take away uh-huh. some of those responsibilities and allowing me to have a much higher quality of life. I feel like my quality of life now is so much better um, than it was even, you know, eight years ago on the farm. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Absolutely. Um, speaking of that, you said that was really hard to let control go. What else has been hard for you on the farm? What would you say the hardest thing has been about the farm? Um, I, I think in general, just the anxiety that comes along with farming. I uh-huh. definitely have, you know, anxiety issues we'll call them <laughs> um, again you know anxiety can be it's like the control topic it's it not, doesn't necessarily need to be a negative part of someone's life it's your ability uh-huh. to live with it right but it's also like anxiety brings a, a bit of passion and a bit of you know it, it lights the flame underneath you and keeps you moving in the right direction sometimes so I think that can be the hardest thing though you have the weather factor of farming uh-huh. you have all these things that are out of your control so I think it's why I, w- I have been a very trying to be in control person of my business because those decisions are about the only thing I can control because uh-huh. there's so many outlaying factors in farming. We can't control the weather. We can't control the economy. And if people are going to be willing to pay us this money to grow their vegetables, we can't control some of the food trends or you know ups and downs that we see in different food channels. We can't control that. So I think those are some of the most challenging parts of it and being able to adapt to those changes appropriately. And for me, I've just had to find other ways where I can almost strictly uh, do the best that I can do to make sure that I take some of those uncontrollable areas of the farm and um, make sure our systems are in place so that we, we can adapt to those when they happen. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, absolutely. Building out the systems that allow you to not have to put that on your shoulders and stress out about it. Right. Yep. Yeah. Very cool. So you mentioned earlier about Peter um, from, I think you said Springdale Farm? Yep, Springdale Farm. Yeah, yeah. And actually, I actually purchased some equipment from Springdale, like literally the second year I was farming in New York. So oh, yeah, they were coming east for a conference and they had an b- empty box truck and I ended up buying, <laughs> I think, a water wheel off of them, which now lives at Andre Caltamo's farm, a heron pond farm on Love the- it. Yeah, in New Hampshire. So anyway, it's just crazy how all this is interconnected. Right. So um, who else were mentors for you? You know, I think my dad and my mom and dad as the primary business starters here uh-huh. were definitely mentors. And, you know, they didn't really know what they were doing. And maybe that's what's great about it is that it reminds me that everything doesn't have to be planned. Uh-huh. <laughs> my parents did not have a plan. I um, When I came on board in 2006, I got a little grant from our um, Department of Ag Trade and Consumer Protection Program where I could hire a professional to help write a business plan. Uh So we're talking like three, four years into the, you know, the existence of Park Ridge Organics and there was no business plan. Uh Um, So because my parents just didn't work like that. They just kind of 
did it. They just do stuff. They just have yeah. ideas and then they make stuff happen. And I, I think that's something I, I look at and have to be reminded of that you can just fly by the seat of your pants. It's not always the best decision. You know, you do have to have some structure here yeah. and there. Um, but it's also a refreshing way to look at stuff and don't overthink it, you know? So to me, that's always something I come back to is remembering that my parents started all this without much of a plan and look at where we are now. And it's, we didn't see that coming that I would buy it from them that I, would you know, still be farming all these years later. And so that's kind of been a mentor to me. I also, uh, I don't know if I have like specific reasons. I guess some things I've heard from other farmers have always been something I've tried to keep in mind. So I remember that, Dave Perkins from Vermont Valley Farm, uh, they have now since retired and stopped farming, but he uh-huh. had said in a conference that it was talking about farmers pay and what you're going to pay yourself and how you're going to live and how you're going to make it all work. And he had said, there's no reason that I shouldn't earn as much money as one of my members mm. buying my vegetables does. Mm. Yeah, that's good. To me, that was a good, uh, it stood out as something yeah. to think about. You know, we, as farming is hard work. I understand that. I also think that it doesn't have to be a always this, you know, very sad situation where people are poor and broke and working really hard. You can actually, if you're, if you work at it, you can form your systems on your farm so that you can be successful financially. Uh And um, I should be able to pay myself a livable wage, similar to what a member that might be buying my vegetables um, is making. And, you know, not, be, and be able to get an airplane ticket once a year to take my family on a vacation. <laughs> yes. I mean, these are things that we shouldn't be ashamed of as a, as a farmer to aspire. You know, we're not, I, you know, I don't want to be rich, but it sure would be nice to not have to worry, worry all the and time. Yeah. worry all the time. Like, and you can set things, you know, I, I don't think it's always easy. I think um, I've, Fortunately, had a situation where I had a farm, you know, I have my parents started the farm. I did have to buy it from them. It wasn't given to me. Um, yeah. So I'm rolling along with some debt and, you know, making sure that my business is, is moving how it needs to. But it's I'm trying to do it without uh, being financially distraught. Right. I'm trying yes. to do it with and not be ashamed of it. I, I want to yeah. make money. I want to make money so I can go on an airplane. I want to make money so I can pay my employees a great wage so they keep come keep coming back and i want to be proud of what i'm doing and uh-huh. so i think that those those that stood out to me that there's yeah. no reason we should be ashamed to try to make some money doing this yeah i mean farmers have the hardest job in the world i feel why shouldn't they be paid like that um you look at some of the people that are making you know millions of dollars a year and you look at actually what they do every day and you're like uh that's not <laughs> that's not what we do um but yeah right. i i i really th- glad you hit on that because that's such an important thing that so many farmers i feel feel guilty that they produce food and that they charge for it um they're like when and they realize that they're what they're doing is so important to the health of our planet and to the health of our communities and my thing is Yes, it's so important, and that's why you should get paid to match the importance of what you're doing. Right. But right. we don't believe that, and um, so many of the conventional ag has tried to instill in us because it's profitable for them to instill in us that we should get paid slave wages for doing the lion's share of the work. Um, right. So anyway, yeah, that's a great paradigm, and I'm glad that that came out um, of that conversation because you're absolutely right. You should be able to afford to take that vacation to a nice sunny place every winter and enjoy yourself. Right, and and I sh- I just want to say like don't get me wrong, there is some very big um, issues with our, with big egg, with, you know, dairy farming in Wisconsin, it's just an awful situation right now. Oh, so, gosh, yeah. Um, yeah. And I guess what I've tried to take away from the farming industry is super difficult and it's not very lucrative for a lot of people working really hard in farming right now. I guess it's where I feel like a, as a vegetable producer and a CSA farmer, we have a really amazing, you know, we have this ability to set our price mm-hmm. to, um, directly sell it to our customer. That's so not, um, it's not the case with like a dairy farmer. Yeah. I, I always feel so bad for that they're so controlled by other people's decisions that um, we really are lucky as CSA farmers to be able to do what we're doing. And um, 
I can't imagine not being able to set the price of the product that I'm growing or producing. Mm -hmm. That would just, it would be awful. (laughs) Yeah. I'm happy that we can do what we do. Yeah. Very cool. If there was like a magic reset button as it relates to starting your farm, what systems would you go back and put in place sooner rather than later? Um, Actually, I think like that open task Mm -hmm. board, kind of having a much more transparent system when it comes to job duties. And um, I would have liked to, I think having that sooner would have been better. And then probably using a customized share system. I, uh, I just think over time, it's going to make so much more sense for us to actually be giving out what people paid. Uh-huh. Um, and so I, I think those are the two things I can think of off, uh-huh. offhand that would be, have been valuable sooner. Very cool. With that, I'd like to stop here and take a quick break. In a minute, we'll be back with Robin Calvi from Park Ridge Organics in Wisconsin. If you've been enjoying this episode so far, you're going to want to head over to growingfarmers.com backslash free resources and download our free resource bundle to help you shave hours off your week and become a thriving farmer. It includes resources such as our 10 winter growing secrets we wish we knew when we started, which is a ebook which talks about the tips and techniques to get better growth in your winter production. We teach things like the simple but counterintuitive principle that trips up most beginning growers, the shape and size of tunnels that are best for winter production, how to prepare beds so they are weed free and get beautiful lush stands of crops, what to do about pests like aphids, voles, and slugs, how to fast track your research to fine tune your production for your microclimate, and how to pack in more crops for higher yields and profits. So head over to growingfarmers.com backslash free resources and download your free resource bundle today. So we are back with Robin Calvi from Park Ridge Organics in Wisconsin. So Robin, tell us a little bit about, you know, you mentioned your team, you've got great people on your team. How do you find great people to work with you? So I I feel like I've been a little lucky because they both, uh, not my two main managers that have been with me for a little bit going on 11 seasons and um, Jeff has been with us for 11 seasons and then Becky is going on her like seventh season, I think. They both came as interns. Okay. So, um, you know, I feel a little bit lucky that they had to come to me. Yeah. So um, we do have other employees that are coming back season after season. So I don't want to discredit them. (laughs) They're great too. Um, But these main managerial roles are filled by people who started as an intern. So they went to universities that required some type of an internship. Um, component to their degree. Uh, yeah. Uh, so that's helpful. And, you know, I haven't, we're, we're really in a great place with who we have. Um, I haven't had to do a lot of recruiting. I will be honest about that. I feel lucky that I haven't had to do that. And I guess that rolls into the, how are, how am I keeping them? Right. Yeah. I'm not having to do a lot of recruiting. <laughs> I think it's a bit of, I think honesty and trust are a big deal. And I, and I mentioned earlier, it's hard for me to give up some of these roles on the farm and not have a say in a lot of decisions. So my longtime employees have all sort of adapted to who I am, right? Mm. They're, they know where I'm coming from. And I've been, and sometimes it's a challenge. I may be stepping on people's toes. I might be coming into a system that's already happening, something, you know, a task that's being done. And I am sort of known for being this you know, I'm going to rustle up what's happening and change it up a little bit because I want it done a different way. Yeah. And through a lot of really trying to have open communication and un- make sure that everybody on my farm understands that when I redirect a task or change something that's already been done or already was decided upon, it comes from a truly genuine place of like passion about the business. So uh-huh. I think being making sure that your employees understand that you're not doing things to just upset people (laughs) or, Uh um, you know, you're really, or or to be in control. I truly make decisions because I think big about stuff. I think big picture about stuff comes down to the end product and making sure that we're doing the best that we can do. And I do, I get a little hung up on efficiency. Uh So I'm always like trying to do things the best way possible, not the fastest, but the best way possible. Well, yes. Um, because there's always that difference between efficiency and effectiveness. And I think as farmers, we right. need to be keep pushing on that effectiveness aspect. Right. Very true. Yep. Uh, no, so I think um, having 
you know, I try to have a, a livable wage. I'm working mm-hmm. really hard to increase our income through various ways. And it's typically just a reflection of what I want the payroll to increase by. Um, yeah. It's important to me that they're in a position where they can um, earn a, a valuable wage to them. So we do have some incentives to employees. You know, I do have um, some paid days off for certain employees. I do uh, work clothing and stipend for employees. Um, yeah. I even try to work a health stipend in for employees and um, trying to maximize the season length. You know, um, yeah. I could just be in the greenhouse by myself for the whole month of March, perhaps. But yeah. that isn't, I don't want that, right? I want to have my employees get another month on their payroll. So I'm willing to make sure that we extend the season as long as possible. N- neither of my managers are full full year long employees. Oh, wow. Um, we don't have full year long work. So it's a day here and there in the winter. We do pack out a, an extended season share. So we're, we're still packing out boxes every other week through January. Yep. Um, we do all of our crop planning in the winter. Um, so those types of things give them some work here and there. But, you know, I, I got to keep getting them back after having to leave for a winter. Uh, we are large enough so that we do pay an unemployment. And I do encourage my employees to take unemployment. Mm. Um, Because it helps them come back. That's what it's there for. Yeah, very cool. So what would you say to someone who, and I think I know you're going to answer, who sees their employees doing something that they're not quite excited about or don't, and hesitates to tell someone to change something because it's not as efficient? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's all about crafting your message and knowing, you have to know the personalities of your employees too. Some people are going to be really sensitive to the way that you approach them about making a change. So I think, you know, approaching a situation by saying, hey, you know, I know that what you're doing is maybe what I told you to do, but I think I've, we've changed our mind and we're going to change it up a little bit. We think that it might just be a more effective way to get this task done. You know, I think just the way you craft your message, also making sure that you're giving enough positive reinforcement, right? So uh-huh. even if they're doing something that you don't want it to be done that way, it doesn't, you know, you still can give some positive encouragement like hey you're doing a great job at doing it that way (laughs) yeah but i think we're going to switch gears here and try it this way because it might just be a better way to um to tackle that so i mean i'm Mm. not giving a specific example but i think it's all about how you craft your message and i like to take ownership and say hey you know i know it totally makes sense to you with what you're doing but i'm gonna i just want to try it this way and if i'm wrong i'm wrong right like yeah i'm willing to own that like just humor me here and let's try it this way. And if it sucks and everyone hates doing it this way, then, then we'll readjust. But yeah, you know, and I think that is like a super fine line. You don't want to be, Oh, I don't know. You don't want to be so controlling of people's tasks that they're not able to think for themselves. Yeah. You don't want to be so abrupt about stuff that it's actually hurting their feelings. Yeah. And Um, I've definitely seen farmers do that. Right. And I know I have done it in certain situations. I'm not always, you know, I'm not always very soft about how I want to approach. Because to me, it's like time is of the essence. I'm I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I think my because my days are a little bit shorter with having a child on the bookends of it. Right. I'm um, trying to get stuff done faster without um, I've definitely lost some worker shares, probably because of my abruptness of how I and yeah. changes. And I think some of that is just, they maybe don't understand that. I truly don't mean to offend people. Um, it's coming from a, a good place. It's just sometimes the message isn't delivered that great. Yeah. Well, <laughs> all, I think, you know, and it's okay. Yeah. I think what you're saying too, is that your job is to make the farm function the best that it can. And the end goal of the farm is to feed your community. And so if you're going to make some changes to help you feed your community better and to also help your employees make more money, they're going to be completely open to those changes that you may come in and make as long as you're communicating that message to them that in the end, it's for everyone's good. Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely how I like to view stuff. Probably one of the most difficult situations I've ever had on the farm involved an employee, like a bad apple, we'll say. Mm, yep. um, I've only had that happen once where I had to basically you know, let somebody go. It was awful. And unfortunately, that person had a feeling that I was, you know, holding back. Like I was, I was, uh, I don't think that they saw the true place that my, my 
where I'm coming from, right? They didn't understand that I'm not doing anything to, I'm not sitting on like piles of money and just holding back from paying my employees better, right? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it was kind of this, this, that was one of the most difficult, it hurt, it hurt, because that's, I think, why it was so hard. It wasn't that hard to let somebody go, whatever, you know, you're awful. But the energy that was sucked for me by having somebody truly think that I was doing things from a malice just from an awful place like oh gosh that was so hard to um emotionally deal with that they just didn't understand that I really do do things come they come from a a good place I have good intentions and it was hard to be challenged on that and have to kind of defend myself that was tricky Mm -hmm. for sure Mm -hmm. Let's talk about your marketing. So you have CSA as the main part. You have a little bit of farmer's market, the on-farm store. Where do you focus on selling? Where would you like to see your farm head in the next couple of years? Yeah, I kind of like all of it. So okay. for us, it's always work to have a little bit of everything going on. You know, obviously shares are the priority for us because it does yeah. make up a larger, and that's by design. We want it to make up more of our of our income and where our production is going because of the the stability of it. So, you know, having a share sold is a sure, it's a sure thing. I mean, Uh it's really a magical system to be able to have, to know what we need to grow and who we're communicating with and um, how we need to grow it and when we need to have it. So I think the CSA model is definitely really important to us. We'll always continue to want to grow it. What's been interesting for us with the Harvey system is that because we are actually giving out the value that people paid, we have been able to take many more members than in the old system. So if you would have asked me four years ago, you know, where do you see yourself going? I would have been like, Oh, we're maxed out. We got, we have seven acres. We have the same amount of production, right? Seven acres in production. But back then we had 250 members and that's all we could take. Mm. And so now we were at 360 members for 2019 and we're going to go up to like 375 members for 2020 because on the same amount of land, we're able to produce, a more focused crop selection. Um, and our value, our value was there before we just were giving out too much produce So, Mm. without having a handle on it. Right. You just, you're so proud of your stuff. It was all about filling the box. It was all about the box volume being filled up versus the value. So I think that that part of it is we probably will continue to be able to take a few more members here and there. I'm not sure. I don't, you know, I think we might get to like a 400, Uh Um, limit member limit um but what i like about having the farmer's market and having wholesale in our little farm store is that the nature of farming is just like you cannot control that you know that there's going to be like two broccoli plantings that line up together Uh (laughs) Um, there's going to be like the green beans that you know that you planted the right seeds per foot but why are there like three times as many beans as you planned on um or the opposite right you plant you planted it but they didn't come up so i think you have to have those we have to have those other outlets to make up for the fact that we, um, yeah, have those little overages. Some of it. Yeah. And we, and I like that. I mean, our, um, our farmer's market is, uh, we're, it's a really popular place. We're one of the top vendors there and, um, we develop potential CSA members from it. And then you also still have a handful of people that don't want to be members of CSA, but they still want to support a farm. So you kind of, to me, you sort of have to have a farmer's market presence to have a face to what you're doing. You could hidey hole and just do your CSA and that probably works for a lot of people. But I think for me, I like to have our our name out there a little bit um, Mm -hmm. with the farmer's market. Well, it's also probably bringing in new CSA members at a slow trickle too, just keeping you in front of people. And it, yeah. And actually now um, through Harvey, there's a second level, second layer to the software where we're able to sell one week at a time. So oh, very people can buy our yeah people can buy a share without becoming a member. Um, there is a, a a surcharge that we put on that um, you know once a week type of yeah um, thing because you know it's a different it's a new person to manage it's a, a new person to learn the the ropes so to speak if they're going to their pickup or whatever it might be but it's really been interesting. I was a pretty against it when I first heard about it. I thought well this is crazy. How are people going to become members if they're if they know they can just buy it by the week, right? They can pick and choose, yeah. buy a week, not buy a week, whatever it is. Well, what it it's the opposite. Everyone who's tried it has come on now to be a member for 2020. So, oh wow, that is so cool. It, it is really cool, and you know, it's, who are we to say? I feel like I've really changed my thought on like some people can't be a member for 20. Uh-huh. Weeks. I mean, that's uh-huh. not fair to be like, 
Well, if yeah. you can't be a member for 20 weeks, then who, you know, shoot, go away and find us at market. No, I mean, yeah. I want people to be able to still support us. So it's really a, um, they call it farm stand and it's just another layer of Harvey and we we're finding it to be pretty great. We've sold out the last two seasons. We've reached our share goal. And so this is a way for people who missed out on getting a share to still kind of try it. And uh-huh. what we definitely are going to see is that they then move on to become a member. And if they don't, that's okay too. Keep buying the farm stand and um, yeah, it works out good. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about new and beginning farmers. Cause you've been in this game now for a while and you've probably seen new people come up. What do you think is the biggest mistake that those beginning farmers are making? Well, it's so tricky. I think, I mean, I think it's probably been said by many other farms too. I think if you start too big, mm. it can be overwhelming, but that, I mean, I've also seen people start out big and do great. So I, I guess making sure that you have a solid, you know, f- find your weaknesses, right? So for mm-hmm. me, I know it was, I had the tools I needed coming into the farm with like my background in financial management, but I didn't yeah. have the tools I needed to know how to grow stuff. Mm. I didn't yeah. know that like once you pick the broccoli, it's picked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it takes a couple of weeks to get a side shoot. And even those aren't that great. Right. So yeah. for me, I had to go and learn some of the growing, um, the more production side of stuff. So find what your weakness is for a lot of, I think a lot of farmers that get into this, their actual, their strength probably is the production side. Yeah. Um, but under, you know, whatever your weaknesses are, figure them out and then spend a good amount of time and put some investment into either, you know, taking some kind of courses or a conference session. I mean, I remember spending eight or $900 on a seven session workshop that Michael Fields Agriculture Institute was offering. Mm-hmm. And at the time, my dad was like, you need $800. And I was like, but I think this is going to be really valuable. It was amazing. Mm. I, still, I still crack open the book. I mean, Richard Wiswall, they flew him in to talk to us about yeah. um, doing farm finances. And we had really great people come and tell us all these different aspects of farming. And um, an accountant came and met with us about how to, how to set up your books. It was, if you have those opportunities to put some investment and time into learning, just do it and never give up on learning. I think the moment somebody feels like they've, they wouldn't value from going to a conference, Mm -hmm. (laughs) the moment you can sort of say, Oh, I I already know all that stuff. I don't think I need to attend that. I feel like you're really missing out because Uh it's always going to be something. I mean, look at just the CSA model. It's changing so much. The move towards customization of shares, all these things are, you know, just like any industry, if you're caught on your heels, it could be a really bad thing. So make sure that you're continuing to get out there and, you know, teach yourself new stuff. Like you can't, uh-huh. it also makes it more exciting on your farm too. I know like the, the change to go to a customized share system was very scary. Yeah. But at the same time, it gave us something new to figure out, right? If yeah. things are feeling like they're getting stale and you're kind of in this rut and you're like, oh gosh, we got to do this again week after week, then change something. Yeah. Um, make well, it more exciting. Yeah. And that was, I think, you know, when I was 25 and been farming, running the farm for, I think, eight years at that point, I was starting to get a wee bit bored because it was just the same thing every single right. year. That's, so that's what pushed me to go intern at Polyface, um, which ended up changing my complete trajectory. <laughs> but yeah. um, it was good to get out and do that, even though that was incredibly hard. And that meant I left the farm for four months. And I was only able to do that with a, an incredible management team. But uh, yeah, it was a complete, it's the complete change of trajectory and really made a, a huge impact on, you know, what we're doing and just, uh, yeah. So anyway, yeah, right. I keep that learning thing. And if it doesn't, doesn't have to be a four month internship, like I did, that was a bit crazy, but <laughs> just going to that conference or um, visiting other farmers. Um, you know, my favorite thing is just to call up a farmer and say, Hey, I, I'd love to come visit with you one day. And I promise I won't ask you to show me around the farm. I just want to work with you for a day and, right. uh, and see how I can help you and how I can just learn the technique that you have. Um, I've been doing it all these years. And that was such an eye-opening experience for me um, back when I was farming. For sure. And we do like in our, in our area, this part of the state, we just have like a winter potluck. Nothing, mm-hmm. some of it doesn't even have to be like an organized event. It's just like, you know, there's like five of us CSA farms in the area that just get together and have a three hour long talk on in someone's living room once a winter, because you need Mm -hmm. to do that stuff. You learn, you have stuff to learn from each other. You also just need to align yourself with other farms to vent with, Mm -hmm. to 
talk about some of the anxiety and the issues that you're all having because you're not alone in it, but someone's probably having the exact same issue. <laughs> yes. And so, um, yeah, I think it's really important to, to kind of have those things in place and know that you have the ability to, and, and yeah, and make changes. You can, you can make changes. You can change stuff if you don't like it. And I, I was the same way as you where I think having a child to me was a great change mm. in our farm system because I was, I kind of did get bored. Yeah. Like the same, you're very, you're very cyclic in the farm world, right? We're like, okay, another season. It's yeah. January to work on sign up, be depressed, take vitamin D. And then we're like, <laughs> okay, it's March. Now it's like crazy. Start up the greenhouse. And then every week is a very repeating yeah. pattern. You know, harvest, 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 pack a box, go to market, harvest, harvest, yeah. harvest, pack a box, go to market. So you do I like, yeah. And I think for me, it's been important. That's another way to you know, keep employees around and make sure I'm changing stuff that we're keeping mm-hmm. things exciting, that we're introducing something new every season that might be just a thing. Like we're going to get some chickens next year because it's mm-hmm. just time, right? We haven't had any meat birds. I want to try it. I, I have a great employee who has a background in animals. Mm-hmm. So I'm kind of getting chickens partly just to give Chloe like more responsibility. That sounds mm-hmm. crazy, but it's true. Like she she needs more responsibility and this is a place that I can give her that I don't know mm-hmm. anything, right? Finding yeah. those weaknesses. I don't know anything about it. She's fantastic. Let's give her more responsibility. So yeah, finding new stuff every season, every season you should have one new thing, whether it's a new crop or a new um, part of your farm. For mm-hmm. Sure. <laughs> mm-hmm. Very cool. So if you could pick one, what would be your favorite farming tool? Um, you know, it's funny. I have an answer for this because every year, John Hendrickson from the Center for Integrated Ag here in Wisconsin does this like March Madness where he yep. makes us. But yeah, yes, it's that's so awesome! It's so much fun. It's really yes. cool. I get really excited about it every year where we have to choose our farming tool. You know, and he does the whole bracket system, and we we all march down to the um, final what the winner is, right? And I mean, yeah. it's things like a hoop house might be one of the options or your laptop computer or all these things in farming that are really tools right so yeah um i've always voted for the red knife the red harvest knife like okay the um, little victoria knox red knife yes the victoria knox yes um I, that's always been like my top pick and yeah. i <laughs> i think it's a uh, it's actually interesting because i maybe would change now to using my my software my member software is maybe a bigger tool on my farm than anything i'm pretty sure of it, but I, I'm a um, tangible person. So I'm going to stick with the red knife and know that uh, there's reasons, right? There's it's yeah. the harvest stuff, obviously. It's also like part of your lunch table. It's going to cut my first red ripe tomato, my air, mm-hmm. first heirloom tomato this season, and I can share it at the lunch table with everybody. And yeah, I don't know. It has like, it's just something that we, ha- we issue them to every employee. Yep. Um, it's always like top it because you find one. You, we issue the, the knife and the sheath and then you'll just find like the sheath lost in a field or you'll, sometimes you're like out there and no one has a red knife. And it's always like a topic of the day. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, we so hide what we the new did, ones, we hide them away and like yes. you have to be, uh, you have to ask really nicely or have a really good reason <laughs> if you need a new one because like so why do we they would, always go missing? <laughs> yes, yeah. So we would actually issue everyone a brand new one at the beginning of the year and that was our gift to them. But if they lost theirs and we would put their initials on them, they paid for the next one. Oh, I think I'd be the worst. I would have to buy like seven a year. So I could do that. I could do it. And then maybe I would be, sometimes I'm the worst at all of the systems, right? The, yeah. Uh, I am the worst uh, at well, writing anything down that I ask everybody else to write it all down. I never write it down. Anyways, but yes, I should probably, I think I did mark my knife because I was being uh, possessive of it. I knew it yeah. was a really sharp yeah. one. <laughs> so the other thing yeah. I do with those knives is I always drill a hole in the handle and then put a little lanyard with parachute cord on it so that oh. when I'm, yeah, so it's a big enough loop so that it can hang off my wrist as I'm harvesting. And so then if I'm like out doing something, I need to drop the knife. It's always just hanging from my hand and I have to go pick it back up. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, I think you'll really. Thanks for the yeah, tip. That will right. Probably... We like have the sheaths and they're on your belt, but let's you know, cold weather, your belt yeah. is like it's hard to yeah. get to, and yeah. it's probably why knives are ending up um, more lost than they are. Yeah. Uh, hey, but yeah. I mean, every time you open a new field, there's probably a few knives you turn up, right? <laughs> right. Well, sometimes cell phones, <laughs> knives. You won't believe the stuff we we do get leaves from our city for making yep. our own compost. Yeah. So we've found in our compost. Um, in our fields because it's come on the leaves. I mean, like, I can't believe how many single shoe flip-flops, shoes, flip-flops. Um, oh, wow. 
it's Barbie doll legs. Like it's super crazy. The stuff that we have. Yeah. Found. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> in our fields, which um, we assume is coming from the uh, leaf mulch. I hope so, anyways. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So, where can people find more about you and your work? Um, our website is probably the best place to find information. And uh, as the official website manager, hopefully, I'm keeping it up to date. But that's parkridgeorganics.com. Okay, very cool. We will send people there. Robin, thank again so much for your time today. This has been a fun interview, and I know people are absolutely going to enjoy it. Thank you very much. So there you have it. Another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer podcast website and leave us a review. That's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com.